Okay, well, I'm gonna get us started then. Welcome everyone, this is a nice big group. Um, you are here at the Starting a Seed Library panel um, and Liz Chenevy and myself, I'm Sarah Pritchard. Um, Liz and I are from the JMU Community Seed Library and we are joined by Justine Hernandez and Jen Lyon. Am I pronouncing your names correctly? It's just Lyon, Lyon, Lyon. like, yeah. Wonderful. Well, welcome. We're, we're all going to be sharing some experiences that we had um, starting our seed libraries. We have varying degrees of um, time in on these endeavors and um, hope that we can have some good conversation later. So just to get started first, a few housekeeping things. Um, the session is being recorded. I'm sorry, I'm looking at multiple screens, so I'm looking away. Um, the session is being recorded. Um, we've already started recording. Um, links to the recording will be emailed um, via Eventbrite a few days after the summit and will be available for two weeks. You can put questions in the chat. We will um, answer them at the end of the panel unless something comes up that we want to speak to in the moment. It's kind of up to the speaker. Um, we'll put our contact information at the end and um, presentation slide, our slide decks will be available in a public folder as well after and, and emailed out with the recordings. Another reminder, if you're interested in the Seeds of Vandana, Vandana Shiva, um, you need to buy a separate ticket for the film and um, they will be streaming this now through tomorrow. So um, I think Liz was gonna, thank you, Liz. Um, the link is in the chat if you wanna get a ticket for that. And if you wanna engage on social media, um, you can use Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and um, hashtag Seed Library Summit, save, share, or Seed Library, and tell us what you think, or have conversations on the side, share ideas. Okay. It's quick. Um, I guess I'll just give a little overview of um, kind of the layout here. So we're here for an hour. Um, each library panelist will be speaking for 15, 20 minutes, and then we'll save some time for questions at the end. Well, I guess we're each going to be speaking for 15 minutes, and we'll, if we finish early, we'll have a little extra time for questions. Um, at that time, if you can just put questions in the chat, then we'll go through and answer as many as possible. Um, and thank you, Liz. There's also a uh, summit feedback survey. You can give feedback on this and other sessions. So um, definitely do so that we can learn what works and what doesn't. And so um, Liz and I are gonna be speaking first about um, the JMU Community Seed Library. And I'm gonna hand it over to Liz to begin and myself. Thanks, Sarah. Um, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. So first, we want to start with a brief land acknowledgement. We invite you to recognize the written histories of the Shenandoah Valley, the city of Harrisonburg, and our university's namesake, James Madison, as fractured. Let us acknowledge then that we are currently on the land of the indigenous Siouan, Algonquian, and Haudenosh oh, I'm sorry, Haudenosaunee, communities who lived here for many generations and who continue to be systematically erased by policies and practices that remove their histories from this place. Let us honor the enslaved people who built the wealth and foundation of James Madison. Let us recognize the histories of Virginia and the United States as complicit with the racism of white supremacy. We recognize that these difficult histories persist in present day racial realities and privileges at this university. We commit to dismantling racism in spaces of our work. We invite you to work beside us to create change. And I want to acknowledge that this land acknowledgement was written by our Center for Faculty Innovation at our university. Um, they put a lot of really uh, good labor into this statement. Next slide, please. So first, um, we're talking about the Community Seed Library that is at JMU Libraries in Harrisonburg, Virginia. 
This is a self-service seed sharing library that is provided by our library um, within the university, but it is available to all, whether they are on campus or in our local community in the city of Harrisonburg or the broader Shenandoah Valley. Um, we provide seeds for vegetables, herbs, and flowers, and we prioritize heirloom or open pollinated seeds and plants that are well suited to growing conditions in the Shenandoah Valley. We also strive to provide culturally relevant seeds, recognizing the diverse populations and gardening knowledge of our neighbors across the valley and their plant traditions. Next slide. So a little bit more of this context of kind of where we are. Um, JMU Libraries, um, our mission is to, part of our mission is to engage with JMU's diverse communities in their creation and search for knowledge. And so when we were, developing our proposal to our library administration, um, which we're gonna talk a little bit more about later, we really kind of focused in on what are our libraries and our university's missions. So again, next the next part down is James Madison's mission is, is that we are committed to preparing students to be educated and enlightened citizens. So we really tapped into these two mission and vision statements in preparing our proposal um, because we, as a university are trying to engage with our local community a lot more um, and that you know we as librarians see that um, knowledge and information creation is not just about the text right it's not just about physical items um, it's not about databases um, that seeds can are in themselves information and they should share knowledge and that we wanted to kind of engage with this in a slightly different way. So we really um, focused in on some of these statements. And then some of the broader context of our library and our community, Harrisonburg, Virginia, where we our university is um, placed is also a refugee resettlement community. So when I was talking about kind of what we prior, what, si what seeds we prioritize, um, we're not only prioritizing the seeds that already grew here or the crops that already grew here, because we are an agricultural region, but we really wanted to um, engage with the diverse community that we have here. I believe our local high school has upwards of 50 languages spoken in it. Um, and so we really wanted to try to engage with this broader community, especially because our institution, James Madison University, is a primarily white institution. Um, and so we wanted to kind of start to bridge those connections through gardening and through seeds. Um, we also just in our general area, we have lots of community interest in the outdoors and in sustainability. Um, we are between a national forest and a national park. Um, in, on either side of our valley. Um, and so we just have a lot of people in this area who are interested in, in these kinds of issues. We're an agricultural region, like I mentioned. Um, so there were just a lot of different kind of parts that we were trying to bring together um, and start to get our students to see how those are connected because sometimes anyone who works at a university knows that a lot, of, especially a residential campus, knows that a lot of our students don't always engage in the community in an incredibly meaningful way. And so we're trying to kind of bridge some of those together. Next slide. And so where we actually are, uh, where our actual library is, um, not just the broader context, we have two locations now, and we'll talk a little bit more about this because we're going to get more into the nuts and bolts of how we developed our library. Um, but we have one cabinet um, on the left uh, that's in JMU libraries on campus. It's in our um, social sciences and humanities library as that is the larger building. It's um, more central in more of central campus. So it has a lot more traffic and it's right in the um, lobby of our library. Um, and so we just found a, we were lucky to find a cabinet. Um, I think it was an old microform cabinet, I'm pretty sure. Um, and so we were able to use that. We were hoping to find a card catalog, but all of those have been taken. Um, but we have a second location now at our local public library in their main branch in downtown Harrisonburg. And they were lucky enough to have a card catalog. So that's the photo on the right. Um, and so we have a smaller um, second location at our public library that's open now that just opened this spring. Um, so that's a little bit of the broader context of our library. And now Sarah is going to get into a little bit more about how we kind of made this happen. Thanks, Liz. 
Um, so first, uh, a little bit about the, the why. Um, this, is our, this is our mission statement. Um, you can see our mission is to provide free access to seeds for all, provide programming to share knowledge and skills related to growing gardens and saving seeds, and relevant resources and information. Um, and creating a mission statement and getting clear on your values and why you are creating a seed library is a really important early step in the process. Um, Liz and I find it incredibly helpful to have a guiding mission that keeps us aligned with the work we're doing. Um, our hope for the seed library is, well, I should say we're very new. Um, we're just about a year old, so we're, we're still kind of learning here. Um, but our hope is um, to create equitable access to seeds. Um, it's impossible to talk about equitable access to seeds without also acknowledging who typically has access to land and free time, um, all of which are needed to grow food. Our seed library doesn't solve all the problems, but we do want to try to lower the barriers to obtaining seeds and supplies. Um, our second location at the public library, Massanutten Regional, um, came as a direct result of our mission. JMU is often seen as a barrier to access for community patrons in terms of things like location and parking. And so the Massanutten Regional Library branch offers greater accessibility for folks who aren't regularly on campus. Um, in terms of programming, um, we're a very young library, so we haven't had many events and we've been mostly uh, an entity during COVID. Um, so we've hosted two virtual events that you can find linked on our website, um, which we'll share. But as we grow and gain momentum in the community and make connections, we want to stay focused on our values of equity and access um, in our programming as well. There's a lot of rich cultural tra tradition around food um, and gardening, and it's important that we reflect this diversity of our community through our events. Um, we don't want to be gatekeepers to local knowledge. We want to be a supportive platform and mirror our community members' experiences. Um, so as you start a library and consider budget, um, please consider compensating speakers for sharing their knowledge and expertise. It's an important way to honor that labor and then to keep the money in the community. Um, and as for resources, um, the last part of our mission, um, we used a portion of our budget the first year to purchase several books for a temporary book display. And then we also have several um, resources highlighted on our website, which um, I'll put in the chat. And so then the how. Um, oops, I didn't hit enter here on our. There it is. Oh, thanks. <laughs> um, so. Liz and I are employed at JMU libraries in other capacities as well, but we're incredibly fortunate to work in an environment that allows us to branch out and create something like the Community Seed Library. So um, a few years ago, our organization started accepting applications from libraries staff to create idea uh, for creative ideas um, that could be funded by donor gifts or foundation funds. Um, so these aren't state funds, they're, they're gifts to the library. Um, and we do need to reapply for a budget each year, but our, our proposal got approved and we did get a budget. Um, we have a pretty minimal overhead because we have a space um, already and we have furniture that we found. <laughs> so um, we've been able to renew our budget twice so far. Um, and we pay for things like envelopes, stickers, stamps, and whenever necessary seeds. Um, we have strong support from our administration and organization for this project, so we feel secure in our funding um, and our place within the organization. Our aim is to funnel this money back into the community through speaker fees and supplying seeds for larger projects like um, public school gardens and food programs. We're actually talking with a few people now about um, supplying seeds for, for various uh, public school, and then also there are a few nonprofit programs for um, food access. And of course, the dream is that we're self-sustaining through seed donations back from community members. Um, we have received generous donations, large and small. This picture is from our grand opening right before COVID. Um, we received a very generous donation of locally adapted seeds from a community 
member and avid seed saver. I'm, I'm watching our time too, I better hurry up. All right, Liz, I'm gonna kick it back to you. Yeah, thanks. I realized, yeah, I was like, oh. Um, okay, so this is a little bit of a timeline to kind of show how we put this in practice. So like Sarah said, we um, applied for this grant funding. So we recognize that we're in an incredibly privileged position um, in our library where um, they want these creative projects that tell a story, right? So that we can tell this story to our donors to continue to get donations to the library in general. Um, so we received the funding um, in April of 2019. Actually, it was like just around this time because I found out when I was at the conference that I was just at this past week. Um, and so then we started really getting started. So when we um, did the grant application, we had already developed our mission statement um, and we had a general idea of like where it would go. We had met with some of our facilities people just to make sure it wasn't in an inconvenient location. Um, and then, so once we had the approval, we decided because we wanted to be this bridge between the campus and the community that we start, we had a meeting with some community members and potential collaborators. So these were some people that are master gardeners, um, a local regenerative agriculture um, organization. So we met with them to kind of see, well, what would you want to see um, out of a library here? Um, and then through that meeting actually is how we got our first donation of seeds, um, which was actually from a friend of one of those people who worked at Lowe's and they were getting rid of some seeds. And we were like, sure, we'll just take whatever to get started. And then we can start to really prioritize the heirloom seeds, but let's just get something. Um, and then it's something fun. We can also give away to students as like, a, hey, come and see this fun thing. We also started working with community uh, student groups, excuse me. Um, so we worked with, um, we have a student group on campus that works uh, to, to um, a campus kitchen to make food for people who um, are unhoused. Um, so we worked with them to host documentary screening of the documentary Seed, the untold story to kind of talk a little bit about food sovereignty um, and seed sovereignty. Um, and then we were kind of working behind the scenes, finding finding that cabinet, um, which took a lot longer than I thought it would. Um, and then we officially launched in February 2020, um, the end of February 2020, I must add, because two weeks later, everything shut down. Um, and but at that grand opening is when we made a connection with some public librarians. Um, one of my boss, actually, her husband works at the public library, so he came and brought his colleague um, and his colleague had been interested in starting a library as well, a seed library. So that is where we started the discussions with our public library colleagues to see about having a sister location there. Um, and we also did a book display because we're librarians, so of course we did. Um, but then COVID came, so Sarah's going to talk a little bit uh, about how we kind of adapted um, since we couldn't have people in our building anymore. Our build, our campus library closed until the summer, um, so we couldn't have people coming in, students or community members, so we had to pivot and see how we could um, still meet that need. Okay, real quick, I promise we're almost done, Justine and Jen. Um, so right, everybody know what happened in March. 2020. Um, so everybody went home and um, we, Liz and I were so amped up from our wonderful warm uh, reception that we didn't want the seed library to just fizzle out. We noticed, you know, of course there's like a national shortage of seeds and people were home and wanting to garden. So um, we made a Google form. I brought all the seeds to my house and we made a Google form um, where people could basically check what they wanted and um, Liz coordinated scheduling so there could be um, space in between people picking up. I assembled packets and we, people picked them up from my porch um, for a few months. We had some um, local media coverage and on social media, it became pretty popular and quickly overwhelming for two people, but um, we learned a few lessons uh, and actually opened it up again this spring. Sorry, I'm skipping on the timeline with a few modifications, like one, one pickup day a week, not scheduling every single person. And we had close to 200 requesters um, in a short amount of time. And um, we are happy to say that we can open our um, carrier library physical location here very soon. And um, it's also, open. as you can see on the timeline, um, that the public library location has been open since November. So there have been a few options for people. I opened the carrier library one yesterday. <laughs> Woo, okay, we're yeah. open. 
tore the tape off. <laughs> okay, and okay. I think that's it for us. Um, we can answer more questions, but this is our email and our website. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and Jen will start sharing hers. One moment. Is there any way to let her know that she is uh, muted? She needs to unmute. Working on it. All right, you guys can hear me now, yeah? Yep. Okay. All right. So my name is Jen Lyon and um, I am in rural Mendocino County, California, which is about two hours north of the San Francisco Bridge. And um, I want to acknowledge that the land that um, we live on here is uh, part and whole um, of the Pomo Nation um, here in Mendocino County. Um, and our seed library is called the Yokeo Seed Project. And Yokeo is the, is the Pomo name of this valley that we uh, live and work in. And I um, am a library technician um, and was a library assistant when I started the um, seed library here at the Ukiah Library about um, 2013. And I also um, managed the one on our bookmobile um, and those seeds travel about 250 miles every week going out to small rural communities. Um, Mendocino County is really geographically challenged. It's very big uh, physically county, but um, with a whole bunch of small townships and um, Ukiah, which is the county seat, is only about 15,000 people, maybe as many as 19,000, but small, small and rural. So I wanted to talk about reasons why you would want to start a seed library. And I think this picture is a really good example of why you would want to start a seed library. Um, you know, beautiful homegrown uh, heirloom varieties. This um, looks like it's Paul Robeson and I grew this amazing, beautiful um, tomato last season and saved seed from, from it. Hey Jen, uh, I don't mean to interrupt, but you're not sharing your screen. I'm not. Okay. Thank you for letting me know. Yep, you're welcome. Hey, Lily. I'm not sharing the screen, so. Yeah. Are we there now? Yes. Okay. So there's that Paul Robeson tomato. Let me just uh, start from the beginning. There we go. Um, all right. So there's our beautiful logo. I'll talk about that in a little bit. That was part of the funding. Um, and there's that beautiful Paul Robeson tomato. Um, so I wanted to talk about uh, reasons for um, starting a seed library. Um, we looked for, we're always looking for um, community needs and um, there are six seed, six libraries in our um, system, and um, there was only one library that had a seed library. And so, um, since we're a rural community um, and we have a 
uh, vibrant uh, farmer's market community. Um, and a lot of people like to grow their own food. Um, we felt that starting a seed library would be a great um, fit and also a way to bring in um, more, um, more folks into the library that might not be coming in. Also, um, you know, it's we wanted to be part of that growing this growing movement of seed libraries. I think the last time I looked at the statistic, it was over 500 seed libraries throughout the world. But I would imagine that has grown quite a bit. Um, also, personal interests of library staff. Um, so the reason um, we wanted to start a seed library was the idea of um, a previous branch manager. Um, Eliza Wingate, and um, I'm pretty sure she hired me because I had a small scale uh, farming background. So prior to working at the library, I was a small scale um, farmer and sold at farmers markets. So I had the skill set. Um, I had a, felt like I had a lot to learn. I wasn't a seed saver, but I knew how to grow seeds. You know how to how to plant them and um, grow out things. So um, so personal interest of the library staff. Um, helping to create um, food security within our community. And um, having worked in the farmer's market um, system, I already um, had that ethos. And um, I really feel strongly without seed security, you don't have food security. So um, having seed libraries in our systems really um, supports that. And um, now all six um, seed, all six libraries have um, seed libraries. Um, so also to grow your own food, you know, the list can go on. So also I think a great, um, reason why you want to be growing to seed is to have the full life cycle of the garden, allowing it to flower, which attracts these beautiful pollinators, um, into your garden. So these were some of the visitors to my garden last season, because I let everything go to seed. So down to the dirt, how, do we, how did we start? What did we do? Um, I, talked to, um, I talked to other seed librarians. Um, fortunately, uh, Round Valley um, in Covalo, uh, which is one of our um, branches, uh, already had a seed library. So I was able to contact uh, Pat Sobrero and um, ask her how she got started. And she gave me her list of donors and, um, and then I took field trips. I did research, found out where there were other seed libraries. Um, I had to drive as far as Richmond to go and look at Richmond Grows, um, which was a couple hour drive for me. And um, also have visited um, the, the seed exchange in Sonoma County um, as well. So reading books of obviously um, is very helpful. Um, and I can recommend seed libraries and other means of keeping seeds in the hands of people uh, by Cindy Connor. And um, the Richmond Grows website is um, incredibly helpful. When um, Rebecca asked me if I would speak on this panel, I said, well, I would say, go to your website, done. Um, but um, she said, no, I'm sure you have your own story to tell too. So um, in this next slide um, was, it's shows you things that you are going to need. So this is just like the nuts and bolts of what you will need. And you'll be able to access this later on when it's made available. So this list will be, um, or you can screen, you know, screenshot it and save it. So it's just a basic list of things that you're gonna need, things to start thinking about um, for working with your seed library. Um, funding. You're gonna to have to figure out how you're gonna pay for it because there are gonna be some costs. Um, and we fortunately um, did a grant and that um, in California where we have the book to action grant, um, which is funded through the uh, California library system and out of Sacramento. I believe our grant was for $5,000. So that allowed us to um, have that beautiful logo designed. We did a competition and that was the winner. Um, and that artist was paid for their work. Um, we feel strongly that people who participate with their skills um, should be paid. Um, although we use an awful lot of volunteer labor to run our seed library as well. Um, so we had the grant and that helped pay for um, some of the materials needed to start as well as 
we did a grand opening and it paid for three lecturers that were part of that grand opening. Um, so we got donations of seeds, mostly um, from seed companies all over the United States. Um, and then um, the Friends of the Library um, has been very gracious and gives me um, uh, funds to work with every year that I can use to pay for um, teachers to come in and help me teach classes or um, also for um, seeds. And they also paid for me to go to the Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance um, uh, teacher training seed school, um, which was an amazing experience. And if you are able, um, I would definitely take a look and find out what courses they may be offering in the future. They have also got a seed school um, online, which I also participated in, which was great. Um, and then the library also, the system can provide some funds for materials like the envelopes and stamps. Um, so you have to look at who and what are your resources. So in our county, we have an ag department and an extension. Um, we have a community college and um, at the ag department, um, I am good friends with um, somebody who teaches some of the ag courses and they come in and help teach some of the seeds, uh, seed saving classes that we teach. Um, so Richmond Grows is there. Um, you can rely heavily on that website. Lots of great information really made starting a seed library very, very easy. You also want to start um, looking at who can help you um, start um, a seed library. It's not something you can do it alone, but it's much easier and a lot more fun um, to reach out to your community members and um, get help. So local gardeners and farmers um, going to the farmer's market, um, you know, setting up a table there, having conversations with the farmers is a great way to, um, to start. And um, we had a master gardener who actually came into the library and walked up to the front desk and, and shook, put her hand out to shake my hand and said, hi, I'm Gail, I wanna start a seed library. And I said, yay, me too. And so um, she helped me, uh, she did a lot of, um, of the seed packaging of all those donations and cleaning up uh, what would become the home of those seeds once um, we had that. So um, that was a great partnership. Um, and if there's community garden network um, connecting with those folks um, and then interested community members, I met with um, interested community members on a monthly basis and we had a discussion um, every month um, leading up to the opening of the seed library and they were very helpful in helping guide me. Also looking for nonprofit organizations that uh, do good work in your community. And, and we have the United Way here in Mendocino County called North Coast Opportunities. And they have a gardens project program and they um, uh, create and build um, community gardens throughout Mendocino and adjacent Lake County. And so I've worked with them uh, quite a bit as well. So you wanna think about how you're gonna house your collection. We've seen, um, how Sarah and Liz housed theirs. And I will show you um, four examples of the six seed libraries. I also want you to think about this little beady eyed critter at the bottom of the page. When you've got seeds, um, he might come visit. I personally had experience with this little guy. So make sure that you are really tidy with all of your, um, your seed collection. So this is ours. We fortunately um, had a seed or a, a card catalog um, stashed away somewhere in county storage. And so we brought it back to life and it's our seed library. Um, it houses um, currently over 2000 seed packets. There's over 400 varieties of seed. Um, and of course we focus on food, uh, herbs, flowers, um, pollinator um, flowers. Um, and at the urging of one of my patrons um, during the pandemic, they said, you don't have very many uh, perennial vegetables. How about adding a, um, that? And so I said, if you do the legwork and give me um, the vendor names, I will buy the seed. And also at the urging of um, one of our Asian community members, also we have um, an Asian uh, collection as well. 
So this is uh, Round Valley's um, library. And like ours, it's self-serve um, honor system. Um, at the Ukiah branch, um, we limit uh, patrons to 20 seed packets a year. Um, but um, I work with organizations, um, you know, community gardens, school gardens, um, um, and reservation gardens, um, and I allow those individuals to take a um, much larger uh, quantity of seed. Um, Fort Bragg um, is staff assisted. Um, they have a welcome table with information, but you need to get the seed, um, make your request uh, at the front desk and they will get it for you. And here's our smallest seed library. And this is the, but the most traveled and it's the shoebox uh, seed library for the um, bookmobile. And that goes out to all the far flung um, communities um, in Mendocino County. And um, I'm refreshing that box every other week. It um, is being um, utilized very heavily um, currently. So I'm really glad that I set that library up about three years ago and it was pretty quiet, but this year it's really being used and I'm really happy to see that. So there's gonna be paperwork involved um, and it's a minimal. We have a couple of um, brochures that we put together threefold. Um, this is the, what is a seed library? And then the other one we have is basic um, how to save seed uh, brochure. Um, and then we also have a membership form and a checkout form. We also have seed envelopes. Um, and these are, this is the outgoing seed envelope. Um, so people who are making donations can put the seed in there and that they can give the information on there. And then this is the um, seed that's packaged to go out. And that also on the other side, um, I attach cultural information that tells you um, describes the vegetable and also how to grow it. So those are the three types of um, paperwork that's involved. All of those um, membership forms are stored here in these um, binders and um, people will write down um, when they check out what they're taking with them. Currently um, during COVID, uh, we now have an online um, PDF inventory. So I inventory the library every three months and um, update it. And um, there's always new seed coming in. I've never um, experienced a shortage of seed. Um, so I felt really, really grateful in that way. Um, so I have not had a hard time keeping the seed library full even um, during this time. And we feel like a lot of seed is going out. So where do you get your seeds from? I try to keep it local, as local as I possibly can. But that first year, um, I got seeds from all over the nation. Um, and I hit up every seed company I could. And they were all very gracious. And um, I think I got seed back from everybody that I asked. But um, I learned that uh, it's best to try and get seed um, from local companies. Um, so that the growing conditions are similar. I also like to buy from regional companies that are small because they grow the seed that they sell. And so they're farmers and that, um, that makes a lot of sense to me. And I try to pay for that seed. I don't ask for donations. I have the funds. So I, I pay those farmers for their um, knowledge and their labor. Um, local seed exchanges are a great way um, to go. We have a, a during non-pandemic times, a great seed exchange annually um, in one of our um, communities across the, the hills here. Um, and it's a seed and scion exchange. So, and it's really, it's just, everybody comes out of the hills and it's really well attended. And our seed library presence is really appreciated. And we um, are a very, very popular um, table at that event. Um, you know, going, to the farmers markets, getting to know the farmers, um, seeing if any of them save seed and if they're willing to save seed. Uh, all, same thing with the community gardens. Um, and you know, heirloom seed companies like Baker Creek and the um, Seed Savers Exchange are always um, very um, forthcoming with their seeds. So I sent letters, I followed up with emails, I followed up those emails with phone calls, and then I when I received um, donations, I sent thank you cards. 
Um, so partnering is a big part of what I do um, with our seed library. And I've partnered with um, the garden club and the master gardeners. Um, I've spoken, um, spoken, um, given lectures for both of those um, organizations. Um, Transition Town Initiatives, ours was kind of winding down. And so they gave us um, all of the seed that they had. And that was some of the seed that we started our seed library with. Um, and you can see um, permacultural uh, guilds, um, community gardens. We have a seed, um, a small seed uh, garden at the food bank. And so we partnered with them on that. Um, and uh, social justice groups um, often are really great at helping us get the word out and volunteer organizations like NCO. Um, getting the word out, promoting your seed library is something that you really want to do because you want people to know that you have the seed and you want it to get out there. And so how can you do that? Um, with our grand opening event um, was really well attended. We had three speakers um, and we were able to give out seed and um, that was a great way to initially get the word out. Also, you know, the paper was there. And so, you know, it was on the front page of the paper. Um, and in our small community, the newspaper still is something that is a really great way to get the word out. Um, I, because I'm a public, in a public library, I do in-house displays, which I try to refresh on a monthly basis. Um, social media, we use a lot. Um, we use, um, Instagram and Facebook, um, and our seed library has a Facebook page, um, as well as, um, posting through the library Facebook page and Instagram. Um, I've done radio interviews and newspaper interviews. Um, programming is a great way to get the word out because you have to do uh, press releases for those um, programming events. And then that gets into, gets on the radio and um, into the paper. And outreach events um, such as um, Earth Day, Farmers, Convergences, um, the Seed and Scion Exchange. So anytime there's um, an outreach opportunity, um, I take it. So these are some of the programs that we um, have done um, at the Ukiah branch and at the um, Round Valley um, branch. So part of my, um, my class with the Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance, I had to come home and do a seed school in a day program. And so that is the flyer for that event. Um, so I'll just show you uh, some of those programs. Um, seed bombs are um, like these little emissaries that um, people really enjoy um, coming in and getting their hands dirty. And um, we linked it with um, monarch rescue. So we use a monarch habitat restoration seed for those programs. My favorite is the fall um, seed cleaning workshop where we bring in seed that we've grown through the season and um, it's hands-on and everybody gets to learn how to use the screens and winnow. And um, so that's a great, um, a great workshop that I really enjoy. And we do in-house displays. And one of our um, favorite workshops is just a seed planting party. And so, um, you know, you, as you can see here, it makes everybody of all ages happy to come and plant some seeds for their gardens. And it gets um, people in to um, learn about the seed library. So here we were at seed school in a day. Um, and I got funds from the Friends of the Library to host this and have it catered because it was an all day event. We hired um, a local chef who um, did most of her um, sourcing from the local farmers. So it was a farm to table lunch. So if you're gonna feed them, uh, they show up. And so we filled the class, no problem. Um, so people are learning how to winnow and clean seed and do germination tests and how to pack seeds. And there's our students and our teachers. So our dream was to have a seed garden um, and we were able to accomplish that with partnering with um, a college instructor. And um, she um, 
grow some of the seed out at the college. And also um, she works with um, a rehabilitation program and um, those folks um, learn gardening skills. And also she has them, she teaches them how to clean seed and save seed. So we get a lot of seed through that. So um, that's it for my portion and I'm gonna exit. So it's now Justine's turn. All right, thank you. And um, I'm Justine Hernandez. Um, I, we have, we wanna save some time. It looks like there are a lot of questions coming through the chat. And um, I think many of our um, origin stories are very similar. So I, I think there was a lot of wisdom in Rebecca sort of um, inviting who she invited to be part of this presentation. Um, so I am here in uh, Tucson, Arizona, which is part of uh, Pima County um, in the southern part of Arizona. And um, I just want to also acknowledge that, um, that uh, Pima County Public Library and its branches are located uh, throughout Pima County on unceded uh, ancestral territories, including those of the Tana Aktam and the Yaki Yoemi peoples. Um, and the Pima County Public Library, and I'm gonna share my screen here, and I'm gonna just zip through because I wanna save some time for questions. Um, so let me get my screen up. Now I am sharing to go there. And present. Okay. Um, so again, Pima County Public Library Seed Library. Uh, we it's just about a year ago, around this time of, or uh, ten years ago, uh, this time of year, um, that these seeds for the Seed Library were planted, um, and uh, and it started with the juicy tomato and this wonderful human being right here, uh, Joe, and at a farmer's market. And um, so that sort of started us on the process. And as I said, a lot of us, I think, kind of share a similar origin story about access and community and connection and food security and adaptation and all those beautiful things that seeds give us. Um, and uh, so we started the process of um, creating a, 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 a system of sharing seeds in our community, sharing and saving and being stewards of seeds. And um, we are, Pima County is, uh, and the library system is a county library system, and we serve about 27 branches in a county that um, serves just over a million um, community members, um, both in rural and urban areas. And so we have branches located in both rural and urban areas. Um, we also uh, have a really deep agricultural tradition here. Um, and uh, so that is the community that we serve. I'm gonna try to speed ahead really quickly here. Um, and so we have 27 branches. Uh, we now, um, just some of the nuts and bolts here. I'm sorry, I'm gonna totally go out of order with everything because I just kind of wanna give you a sense of um, the scale of our library system. And we're a little bit different because we are, I think a larger library system, which is, and, and we've been kind of going at this for a long while and um, also owe a lot to Rebecca um, and the folks at Basil and the folks at um, West Wind Seeds and all those who came before us and the traditional seed savers and their knowledge. Um, um, so, and our community <laughs> and just all of the wonderful people who helped make this happen. Um, very similar stories to um, Jen and, you know, just this sort of community collaboration um, that took place. Uh, we are, um, we also focus on open pollinated and heirloom seeds. 
We are a donation-based seed library. Um, much of our seeds came initially from kind of reaching out to folks um, at seed companies, but also uh, through our connections here in the community of local gardeners. Um, and ideally that is kind of our, our hope. Um, and so kind of sharing some images of some of the seeds that have come in um, to us and in, in the, the various forms over the years. Um, I guess I'll kind of share some of the nuts and bolts again, because of our scale, I think we really had to over the years um, kind of evolve our systems to kind of feed our particular needs. And I don't by any means think that this is, you know, what works for everybody. And that's kind of the beauty of this wonderful community of seed libraries is that we all kind of can share our experiences and evolve and kind of shape ourselves to fit our communities and our needs. Um, and so we have these donation slips that we um, make available to folks in the branches. Uh, the seeds are available um, throughout all 27 branches either and they're available um, online cataloged um, for folks. So when we do receive the seeds, we kind of have the system of processing our seeds um, sort of this is the initial kind of triage. So kind of looking at the information and somebody had asked us on the questions about how we kind of verify. And so we hope that it, um, people kind of share with us some information about the seeds and we kind of try to prompt them about um, kind of their, the steps that they took to ensure or where the seed came from originally. Um, we also provide seed screens for folks um, and then we further kind of take that information and then we kind of create some slips for ourselves. And this is kind of a new thing um, because we did begin a, um, to kind of consider the age of our seeds, um, you know, felt uh, recognizing that some of the seeds that we had, you know, might be kind of past their prime. I mean, they're already coming to us from expired seeds from seed companies. And so, um, we started to think about how we can manage the seeds that we have and, and ensuring that we are um, kind of making the, the seeds available to our community, that they have the sort of vigor and, and vitality that will ensure that they are successful gardeners. And so we have kind of created this slip for us that we use to kind of identify when the seeds came in, what year they were harvested and this kind of goes in our package. We've also kind of developed our own kind of using um, uh, my spacing. I wanna use uh, the viability charts, kind of created our own viability charts um, with the varieties that we see. So we have this um, system of kind of knowing um, how long we wanna kind of keep seeds or sort of optimal viability. Um, and then we also kind of, because we're a large library system, again, 27 branches uh, available to folks throughout Pima County um, and librarians whose roles are transitioning, you know, may move on. And so kind of wanted to systematize things to make it um, easier for other folks to slip in. Um, I have been fortunate in that I have been a part of the seed library since the beginning, as have some of my other colleagues, but we get new folks all the time. So it was really important for us to kind of create a system that um, other folks could easily transition into. So we have a lot of um, sort of helpful guidelines. Um, we also use a database to collect our information. Um, and we have, you can see here, um, everything has Oh gosh, we have so little time and I know there's so many questions. Um, I, I'm actually going to, I, I want people to be able to ask some questions here. So I'm gonna kind of pause because we have about five minutes. Um, my contact information the, for the seed library is at the end of this. Um, and we are always available to kind of respond to folks. Um, that is our, our greatest pleasure is to kind of help other seed libraries so um, I am going to 
stop right here. I'm sorry, because I want people to be able to ask some questions here. So um, that's okay with everybody. Thank you, Justine. That was a really beautiful presentation. I'm sorry, there's so much no, more, but. I know, and we could probably. I wish we had had a longer session than an hour, but oh well. We, we probably needed more time and, and yeah, I think we did. Um, um, but I did see some questions here that I wanted to, um, I think a lot of folks had questions about um, funding streams. I think that was a really, um, big one. We started off with the grant also like a special um, state library grant of $5,000. And we use that primarily to buy books in our collection and purchase some furniture. I see another question about um, just seeing which database you use. Uh, we use access uh, for our database. Okay. So you built your we built a database um, through access and that allows us to run all sorts of reports. And we also use a, an ILS, We're in, we use Sierra. So that enables us to um, put everything in our catalog so people can actually reserve seeds um, and people can check out 10 packets of seeds a month from our library location. And that's very cool. Um, there are a lot of questions. <laughs> Let's see. Um, Liz, are you seeing? I'm trying to scroll back up. I think we answered a few in the chat. Oh, um, sorry, I see this one uh, for anyone to answer. Do you have concerns about, or have you experienced any problems with people returning seeds and them not being what they said they were said to be? I'm getting lots of resistance from people allegedly scared of bioterrorism. Oh, anyone wants to? <laughs> yeah, um, we definitely, we have the slip um, and uh, we have become, and this is not expected of people because we didn't start off as seed folks, but a lot of us have um, either people who were kind of plant geeks gravitated towards this in the library system. So some of us have a sense of seeds, but we definitely, if there isn't enough information, I don't think we worry that somebody's going to intentionally, but there are some people who just don't know. And so if there are things that, um, you know, are just kind of vague, you know, then we don't put it into the collection, um, but we don't also necessarily get rid of them. And so if it's just something that says cantaloupe, but we don't know what variety of cantaloupe, we may then just set those aside for seed bombs or something like that. Um, yeah, I, I set those vague seeds aside for seed swaps and take them yeah. to seed swaps. Yeah. You know, I, I don't put it out. Um, yeah, I'll just say I, we haven't, we're not at that point yet, just since we're still in our first year. So we haven't had a ton of people returning, but we have had a few people um, that have said, you know, like, I want to be like, I've, um, they're very cautious about what they put in their garden. So we just told them we would pull from the stock that we got from trusted source, trusted sources, right, that we purchased. Um, but one thing I will, that I do tell people, especially in our area, since we're an uh, industrial agricultural area, um, and there's a lot of GMO corn and soy in our area, um, that a lot of times the corn, like the donation of corn that we received from a local farmer who, who adapts seeds to our area and is an avid seed saver that Sarah mentioned, he even has said, like, he can't completely guarantee that his corn hasn't been contaminated, right? And so um, we try to just also let people know that the area we are in, it's not always a, a total guarantee that something won't cross pollinate. Um, and that's just a risk that someone may have to take, but um, we just try to be transparent. Yeah. So, um, You know, I, I had shared that we have this database and 
So we put each donation into this database and it assigns a, a unique number. So an accession number essentially for each donation. And that goes on the packet as we package those seeds up. And um, that enables us to one kind of follow that packet. So if there was ever a concern about the health of the seed um, I, or the age of the seed. I mean, we use it primarily to, to kind of call our collection and pull the older seed out. But then also we can, if somebody says something was up with the plants that they grew, we have that number and can kind of explore that further. You know, so it helps us, as I said, because we're such a, a large seed library too, I think we have done things kind of beyond what some folks have done just to kind of help us um, kind of follow our, our seeds. Um, I'm seeing a lot of... Some people are asking about, uh, you know, like quantity of seed per mm -hmm. seed packet. So I kind of go by um, the Seed Matters um, handout about um, how many plants you need for genetic viability. Um, so I, I, like if it's beans, the minimum would be 10 seeds because you need a minimum of 10 plants. It's the same thing with lettuce. So I kind of go by, you know, what, how, how few plants you would need. Of course, with some, I give a lot more. It just depends also on how much seed I have. If I have a lot of something, then it's, you know, it's a really nice heaping teaspoon rather than just a few seeds. Mm -hmm. And yeah, when I purchase seed packets, I break them down into smaller amounts. Um, Cause often when you buy a seed packet, you never use the whole seed packet um, and you keep it for years. Um, so I break them down into smaller amounts, more usable amounts. We were doing a similar thing. Um, we did not, I think because there there's only two of us and we had sort of an unsustainable uh, <laughs> porch pickup model. <laughs> um, it, it wasn't bad, it was just, um, it's kind of a lot to, in the first year also hone in that level of detail that Jen was talking about. So we would just do, a shake <laughs> and, and put it out and and you know people we haven't received any complaints I don't think Liz handles the email but so far so good. <laughs> it's pretty we're pretty um low maintenance <laughs> yeah I um, saw part of that question too was about like do they need to be library patrons do they sign membership forms at least in ours no um ours is completely we don't have it even tied to our ILS um we wanted it to be completely self-service um, now that it's been the contactless porch pickup, it's not self-service. Obviously we are doing a lot more labor, um, but our initial plan was just seeds are there, look through, take what you want, return it if you want. Like it's all very honor system-y. Um, and that's how the one at our public, li the second location at our public library is running that way as well. We didn't want to, um, especially in our, our academic library, the majority of our frontline staff are student workers. And I didn't, we didn't want to burden any of those people with having to learn a whole new thing that they need to check out, answering a lot of questions. We wanted it to be, um, take the burden off of them a little bit. Um, and it just is a little, you know, we have full-time jobs elsewhere in the library, so it makes it a little easier on us. So ours is completely open to anyone because as a public institution, our library is open to the community. So anyone can come in, take what they want and drop off what they'd like to also. Um, I see a, a couple of times, a couple of folks have asked the question about the ILS and um, I think we may be the only ones using an ILS on this, on this panel right now. Um, and that is a great question. How, how are we um, handling the due date portion um, for checking out seeds? And that was, yeah, that was kind of a challenge initially. And what we did is uh, we worked with the folks who um, manage the ILS to um, to set the due dates. So they have this, they have their own item type. Um, so it's recognized as seeds in the catalog. Um, 
and uh, those have a due date of three months. And, um, but ideally we try to, we actually have to delete them off of folks' accounts rather than having people return them. Um, and so it's a manual process. Uh, we actually have somebody on our team, thankfully, who works on that tech side. So uh, once a month at the beginning of the month, uh, they run a report. So we gather all kinds of information. We're librarians, we're like hoarders of info. Um, but we sort of gather statistics like what locations they were checking out from, not personal information about the patrons, but locations, types of seeds. And that kind of helps us know what is of interest to folks to what things are checking out and what locations. And um, so we gather that data and then those records are just clear. So they come off of people's accounts um, and then they're free to check out their 10 packets again for the month. So that is how we do it. Um, I did want to just something that's I think we learned later because we started doing one seed um, and we actually with the idea of combining people's um, donations together into, into a larger donation and kind of also getting that genetic diversity. Um, but we had an infestation because we did it with beans one time. So somebody had beans that had little weevils in them and it spread to the whole donation, which was really heartbreaking. So we have actually started um, in the last few years, any donation that comes in from the public, we stick in the freezer for several days to make sure that we kill anything. And I, I you know, for folks who are taking in donations from the public, that might be a consideration for folks. and. Um, I know we're going over and I don't know if that seems to be okay, <laughs> but I please email us and um, if you have questions to really specific ones about the kind of back end systems, I think a lot of people who are in public libraries anyway are kind of interested and in, have questions about that and we'd be happy to share. Yeah, thank you. And thank you everyone for staying a little bit over, I realize yeah, there's still questions out there. Liz just put our contact info in the chat. So please feel free to reach out with more questions. Um, and thank you for being here. And thanks to our panelists. And I hope you continue to enjoy the Seed Summit. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.